Hello my peeps, my name is Kat aka Kakibot and you probably know that I have spent the last 12 years living as an immigrant from the continent here in this beautiful land of Scotland. And I have a confession to make. Not once have I really attempted to learn one of the official languages beyond English. Now you probably already know that Scotland has four official languages. Together with English there's also the British Sign Language, there's the Scottish Gaelic and there is also Scots. And that, my peeps, is what this video is going to be about. It's going to be about Scots and my journey trying to learn some of it. Now, I have three reasons for that. First one being, I freaking love this country. It's amazing and I do want to delve deeper into the culture and the history and yeah, I want to be one with Scotland a lot more than I used to be. Second, this is January and we are getting very close to one of Scotland's signature holidays, which is Burns Night. And Burns Night is just one of those days when uh, Scots actually comes in handy. I have friends in the hospitality industry who are constantly asked by their bosses to recite some burns. So uh, I was thinking that uh, it is an actual like marketable skill this time of year. And my third reason is I was actually asked by an online language learning service called italki to make a video about learning a language and they basically said look like why don't you learn some German or Spanish or why don't you make a video about learning English I was like blah English I know English I don't need to learn any more English this is a lie it's always a struggle but <laughs> I thought that for both me and you, this would be the perfect opportunity to actually talk to someone who specializes in teaching Scots. I delved deep into their vast collection of teachers. They have like 30,000 plus teachers on their website. And I found one teacher of Scots and I thought, well, that's it. That's the challenge for me. I'm going to try and talk this person into making a video with me. I'm going to share it with you and we are all going to get some good insight into Scots together. So yeah, let's do that. Now, Scots is unfortunately kind of buried under a whole heap of myths that need busting and uh, misconceptions, misunderstandings. I think that the most important myth to bust here is that Scots is not slang, it is not a dialect, it is its own actual language. And I think that one of the complicated things is that then there's also Doric, which I think some people might say is just kind of like more cared for, more detailedly described language subset of Scots from Aberdeen and around. But I think that people who do actually study or teach Doric, which, you know, is something you can do at the University of Aberdeen. You can take uh, classes in Doric. Some of those people might very well tell you that it is its own language. And it is really great that there are people who are so invested in keeping these languages alive and well, because you know, it's not always been like that. Uh, from what I've heard from both Michael and other people who have lived and especially grown up here in Scotland, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, it used to be that if you used Scots in classes in school, you would straight up get punished for it because it wasn't the proper speak. So um, yeah, I think that a lot of people ended up kind of internalizing that uh, Scots is wrong, Scots is for the lower classes. And it is great to see that that belief is starting to really leave Scotland now and instead it's being replaced by this enthusiasm for Scots as a language. Um, one thing that you can see in stores, in bookstores especially, is some of the more popular literature is getting translated into Scots. You might see uh, the very famous wizard book translated into Scots, uh, which might make a good present for someone. But also you can see Roald Dahl books and even uh, the Asterix comic books. Um, you can get those on Amazon as well. Not that I want you to support Amazon, but it's just that the first one I mentioned is usually the easiest to buy and the other two bit less easy to, to get your hands on in like physical stores. So if you were looking for Scots Asterix, Amazon will probably save today. Anyway, as I was learning more about Scots, uh, one thing that kept coming up is that uh, the spelling is very often not unified across Scotland. Kind of like the pronunciation is and the use of the word 
tends to be relatively unified, but how you spell something is not. And I've actually noticed this before and I never knew, like, is this my fault? Or, you know, I would use a certain word, I would like put it on the screen, spelled a certain way, and someone in the comment section would not maybe correct me, but they would just write it differently. And I would think, oh, is it, did I, did I misunderstand? Or like, is my source wrong? Like what, what happened? But Michael reassured me that this is actually something that happens all the time. There are people on social media, let's say Twitter, who are trying to kind of popularize Scots words and terms, and they are being corrected all the time. And these are people who consider themselves experts on Scots. And, you know, people who talk to them, who react to them, are people who use Scots. So they their knowledge of the language is also very valid. Um, so yeah, maybe the internet will eventually lead to some sort of unification, but um, I'm not sure that's gonna happen anytime soon. So until then, if you ever feel bad for misspelling something in Scots, maybe it's not your fault. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's just, that's just how the language is. The upside of that is that it's quite a phonetic language. So unlike certain other languages, which uh, are famously horrible for trying to just like guess the pronunciation because they are kind of like this, this mutant creation living somewhere between like German and French and sort of like leftover Viking languages. Scots seems to be a lot more straightforward. But still, learning all of these things about Scots has left me with this innate feeling of, well, so where do I start? Like this seems like a slightly disorganized language to try and learn, especially given only two lessons to try and make some progress. What do I do? And I thought, you know, with Burns Night coming up, maybe this is finally the time to dive into some older Scots, you know, some late 18th century Scots, which, you know, might not be super practical for modern times. But hey, you still hear it today at events. And if you wait until the very end of this video, you might be able to judge if I've learned anything or if I just totally mangled it. Uh, I'm uh, not looking forward to hearing from you who know how to uh, recite it and pronounce it perfectly because I can't, but I tried. Now, before we jump into our first Scots lesson, which we are going to be taking together, uh, I wanted to tell you more about italki, the language learning website that made this all possible. Italki is a website absolutely jam-packed with certified language teachers, over 30,000 of them actually. And as you will see in this video, Italki's fleet of lecturers goes way beyond what you'll find with some of the other language services, because I don't think I've ever seen Scots taught or talked about on any of the other platforms or apps. But of course, if you're coming to the UK, you know, visiting or moving here, you might just want to pick one of the literal thousands of native English teachers or perhaps some Scottish Gaelic if you really want to impress at parties. All of these wonderful people are certified native teachers who offer one-on-one -on -one lessons, many with extremely flexible schedules, so you can really build your routine around what you need. Learn anytime, anywhere. What a way to improve your listening and speaking skills through talking to natives without the relatable stress of having to make local friends. Or at least I hope that's relatable, because I genuinely find that challenging. Well, hopefully now, with my newly acquired Scots skills, a whole new social world will open itself up to me. Oh, and also, italki is cheaper than buying a couple of Scotsmen a pint with its paper lesson model, not a subscription. So if you'd like to try and learn some Scots, Gaelic, or just brush up on your English, check out the link in the doobly-doo to start your own language learning adventure. Right now, you can buy $10 credit and get $5 credit for free for your first lesson using my exclusive promo code KAKIBOT. That's K-A-K-I-B-O-T. The discounts are only available for the first 50 users. And now let's talk to our teacher of Scots, Michael. Okay, well, uh, if I may uh, first ask you something about you, so a, a brief introduction, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I think, okay, so in relation to Scots, I think I have kind of the same history that lots of Scottish people my age and certainly above, possibly a little bit younger as well, that, you know, most people have. So I am 39 and, you know, growing up, it's like, 
you use a lot of Scots words, but you're not, certainly with some of them, you're not very often aware of the differences between that and English, um, because they're used, certainly in Glasgow, in the kind of central belt, they're used very, uh, you know, linked. They're, they're very mm. related. So things that you don't realise, uh, there are times that you use Scots words and sometimes you don't realise they're Scottish until you speak to someone in England, for example, and they have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, so an example is like, re remember the old cameras with the, the actual physical film yeah. that we used to use. So in the, the little plastic case for that film, we always called it, in Scotland, we always called it a spool. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you would take your spool to get the film developed and then get your photographs. And if you use that word spool to an English person, they have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so it's kind of things like that. Um, and then also, um, again, you sort of learn a lot in school about poetry, Robert Burns particularly, when, and songs when it comes to St Andrew's Day. But then, as I said in the last lesson, you have this odd juxtaposition where you learn about the the poetry and the literature. But then if you use a word like wit or I in the classroom, um, which mean what and mm. yes, I should say, uh, you know, your teacher gives you into trouble. No, speak proper English. So you have this sort of odd juxtaposition. And I think that's true in Scottish society in general, where you have this mix of using Scots with English, but also, you know, a, a sort of slightly negative view of it. So mm. I kind of grew up with that view of Scots the way many people did. You said it's phonetic, so like it should be kind of, um, there should be, it should come naturally to people, right? Like when reading it. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's true. There is one difficulty with Scots, which again, we talked about it mm. earlier. Um, for a large part of its history, it was generally a spoken language. Mm. Uh, and as you said, without a kind of standard um, orthography or, or, you know, rules of spelling. So you will very often find a Scots word can be spelled more than one way. However, when it comes to the sounds of the letters, it's generally pretty uniform and the consonants in particularly are mostly as they are in English. They're pronounced mm -hmm. the same as English. It can be the vowel sounds that can be a little bit tricky. Mm. I think, and again, I should say I'm no expert on um, phonology, but um, Scottish people, whether we're speaking Scots or English, we tend to make our vowel sounds quite open and short as well. And I think that applies definitely in Scots. Um, if you speak Spanish, for example, um, the, the the vowel sounds are generally a, mm. e, e, o, u. And although we have extra sounds in um, Scots, we do tend to make the vowel sounds that same way. They tend to be open and they tend to be short as well. Mm. But we do have other sounds, of course, in Scots, uh, same as English. I think there are two main pronunciation difficulties um, for people who are not Scottish, but of course that depends on mm. what your first language is. Um, the first one is the CH sound, uh, but it's probably most famous in loch, mm -hmm. the word loch, which means lake. Uh, so loch ness, for example. So it's a kind of sound, <laughs> like trying to clear your throat. Um, and then the other one is, the glottal stop and that's when you it's not really silent but you don't really hear the letter t in a word so people from london do this as well and probably the most famous example is saying harry potter mm -hmm. so people from london will pronounce it as harry potter mm -hmm. and we do the same in scots so potter mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, or as we would say in scots water mm -hmm. um, so it's not silent but there's kind of like a, a stop in the air mm -hmm. um, from your voice box um but we do it at the it's okay in the middle of a word like water but we do it at the end of words with the letter t as well and that's more difficult it, mm -hmm. for example um if you try to speak scots and you can't do that that's okay because not everybody does but those are i would say those are the two most difficult 
parts of pronunciation. What 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 things do you think you would need to explain to a person before uh, giving them a poem to read out loud? <laughs> I suppose the main thing I would say, especially with the poem I have chosen, um, is that, well, poetry is difficult in any language. Mm. Um, even in your first language, poetry is difficult. Mm. So, although people will probably be able to read, to see this poem and recognize a lot of words because they'll be similar to English, um, and, and a lot of it is the same as English, actually, um, it is difficult to sort of, you know, describe the poem and you know, things like that. Uh, and then also I should say this poem was written more than 200 years ago, so it does use words that we don't use now. We we have three main celebrations in Scotland at this time of year. So uh, one has just passed. We have St Andrew's mm. Day, uh, which is our the day of our national saint on the last day of November. We also have um, New Year, which we call Hogmanay um, in Scotland, and that has very distinct traditions different from uh new year in other countries but we there's a very famous song written by robert burns that we sing at new year called old lang syne and the reason we sing it is because it's about looking back and looking forward as well so uh and then the the last main scottish celebration we have at this time of year is january the 25th and that's a celebration of robert burns because that was his birthday um so 25th of january and that's when we have a very traditional scottish dinner with traditional scottish music and a haggis and that's when we say the poem that we're going to look at today which is called to a haggis <laughs> Okay, so this poem, uh, again, as we said, it's written by Robert Burns, and we say it uh, before every Burns supper, so which takes place on the 25th of January. It's a very formal dinner um, with traditional Scottish music and also with uh, a haggis as well. Haggis in Scotland is traditionally served with turnip and potatoes, which in Scotland we call neeps and tatties. So, um, the, the ugh, I don't know the best word to use to describe him, but the, the person in charge of the dinner, <laughs> he normally says this poem before uh, the, the, the haggis is served. So what I'll do, I'll, I'm going to put it on the screen and I'll point out some common words. As I said, this poem was written 200 years ago. <laughs> not everything is used now or at least not commonly used but there are common words in this you will come across mm -hmm. and hopefully when people see it they'll discover that yes a lot of the vocabulary is similar to english so uh let me see uh so this word tack mm -hmm. is very common and it's take mm -hmm. so a boon the maw you tack your place. Um, this word all with the apostrophe is all. So mm -hmm. above them all, you take your place. He's talking about the haggis saying, you know, you are better than every other food. So above them all, you take your place. Um, interestingly, actually, this word, uh, this apostrophe uh, is known as the apologetic. <laughs> uh, sorry, apologetic apostrophe. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And you can see it a few times here. So writers at the times of Robert Burns, they used this quite a lot. And this was because Scots was developing a reputation as being, you know, a poor alternative or a poor version of English. And so to avoid the idea that it was just a... No, sorry, I should have said that differently. So basically what contributed to the idea of it being a, a poor version of English is this apostrophe here because basically it was seen as an attempt just to kind of make it a little bit different and mm -hmm. it's like uh well okay it's kind of english but it's not really so we'll put in this apostrophe to mark some different words so mm -hmm. uh but even even when we talk english a lot of the times we will pronounce these the same so this one here is of great chieftain of the pardon race so the the great chief of dinner for example mm -hmm. but you can see here this is of and even in English, Scots will pronounce it as a uh, instead of of. Mm -hmm. So it's quite an interesting thing, this apologetic apostrophe, because it's kind of like apologising for the Scots language. Um, 
we, this word wheel is quite common as well. Uh, a lot of people think it's like the wheel of your car, but it's not its wheel, it's well. Mm -hmm. So well are you worthy or a grace as Lang's Mac Arn. So well are you worthy, you are very worthy of a grace, of, of a blessing, as long as my arm. Lang, you'll come across as well, uh, meaning long. So this is an example where uh, English words and Scots words are very similar, but in Scots, the vowel is different. Mm -hmm. So in English, it's long. In Scots, it's lang. And there's lots of examples like that in the Scots language. Um, the groaning trench are there you fill. Your hard this is a really good word. It's not very common now, but you might come across it. Your hardies are your buttocks. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> it's a very good word. I really like this word. Um, let me see if there's any others that are really common in today's Scots. Uh, is now. His, so in terms of grammar between Scots and English, a lot of the words like my, yours, his, uh, he, she, and so on, are all very similar. But uh, we have emphatic forms and also unemphatic forms. So when you know who you're talking about or you're not stressing the mm. subject, we tend not to pronounce the H in the word his. So in English, you would probably say this as his knife see rustic labour dight, but in Scots we would pronounce it as his knife. Mm -hmm. So we have his knife versus his knife. But if we want to be emphatic, if we want to stress his knife, okay, instead of another person's, then we pronounce it like English. His knife see rustic labour dight, rather than another person's. But if we know who we're talking about, we would take away the H, his knife. Interesting, okay. Yeah, uh, and and again we have these apostrophes and with, um, and we again in English, sorry, in Scots we would pronounce these as an and we, and cut you up we ready slight, uh, like oni, uh, any is oni, um, again you'll uh, so again you have an example where the vowel sound changes, more common in the east coast like mm -hmm. oni ditch. Yeah, this is a really good word, reek. Um, it's quite difficult to translate. In a general sense, it means to, to smell mm. or to, to have the smell of. But we have a very common expression called, uh, which is, lang may your lum reek. And uh, I, I can, I'll put that in the chat room for you as well, actually. <laughs> um, if I can find it. Uh, chat room. Okay, so, lang may your lum Okay, and this phrase, um, so your lum is the, the chimney of your house where the fire is. So if you say to somebody, especially if they have moved into a new house, you can say lang may your lum reek. And basically what that means to somebody is, I hope that, you know, for a long time, for many years, your house is warm and cosy with the fire. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so to reek... However, to reek, it can mean another thing as well. It can mean to smell disgusting. On its <laughs> it, that, that's reeking or that reeks. Uh, let me see. Uh, the Gidman. Um, so the Gidman is just the, the head of the table, the, the mm -hmm. most important person at the dinner. Yeah. Um, hour is over. Mm -hmm. Um Ah, this is a really good Scott word. To spew is to vomit, to be sick. Yeah. Basically, what Robert Burns is doing here, uh, you can see here he's talking about French ragout, about olio, which is like oil, uh, fricassee, which is another French plate, uh, another French dish. Um, and basically what he's doing is he's saying that haggis is better than all of these. You know, like <laughs> Anybody with all of this food, uh, would they... Would they look down with sneering, scorn for view on sick a dinner? So would they look down on the haggis? And then, the, so as I said, there is some vocabulary here that is really good, and you know people will come across. But there's another four lines here uh, called the Selkirk Grace, and this is what people say 
directly before we begin to eat the haggis mm -hmm. at the burn supper. And this is a little more, you know, like things that you might hear people say. So, some hay, I'll pronounce it first of all, some hay meat and canna eat, and some would eat that want it. But we hay meat and we can eat and say, let the Lord be thank it. So here, this is a little bit more like things you would hear. So canna is can't. Mm -hmm. But there's different forms of this. So some people will say canny and other people will say canna. Canna is more common in the Northeast, in mm -hmm. Aberdeen. Mm -hmm. Other places would say canny. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's also the same with don't. So you have dinner and dinny for don't. Mm -hmm. So some have meat and canna eat. He is to have. But again, there's two different forms of have. So you'll find he and you'll find have. He and have. Uh, and some would eat that want it. So would is would. Uh, some would eat that want it, but we pronounce it want it. Mm. Uh, and again, the it would normally have the glottal stop. Mm. It. So, and some would eat that want it. But we hay meat and we can eat and say the la and say, let the Lord be thank it. Yeah. So some have meat and cannot eat, and some would eat meat that want it. In other words, some people have meat and sorry, some people don't have meat but want it. But we have meat and we can eat, and so thank you to the Lord. Thank you to God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a little this has more in common with modern Scots compared to the, the poem. Okay. Well thank you very much. Um one thing that um I always find confusing in kind of I, I know that you said that uh the, the, the whole kind of written form can be a bit, you know, all over the place. But the sort of the, the A E, like <laughs> sometimes it, it seems like it's pronounced like A but sometimes it's kind of pronounced as E, like Kenny, like sometimes people spell that with A-E. I always thought it was, I always thought it was Kenny, <laughs> because that's kind of how that would, that would make sense to me to pronounce it that way. But it seems like that, 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 that sort of sound, or like there's like two different sounds for that spelling. <laughs> Uh, do you know, I, you're actually right, and I have to say that's something I haven't thought about before. I, I think it's one of those things, it's like, you know, when you speak a language, there's certain things about it you don't really think about until someone asks you. I think it's more to do with the stress of the word. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, in the words mm. T mm -hmm. and A, you have the slightly longer A sound because there's only one syllable in those mm -hmm. words, so that's where the stress is. So those two words, te and de, mean to and do. So to do is te de. <laughs> and then, but with the other words, the, the stress, canny and dinny, the word is, the, the stress is on the first syllable, mm. can and din. So I think that accounts for the difference in the pronunciation because it's not stressed. So canny and dinny, and then T and D. Okay, okay. I, I imagine that uh, if, if someone is uh, truly kind of immersed into Scots, uh, that, it, that it starts coming naturally. Uh, yeah, but I think for, for now, I will probably keep being slightly confused by it. <laughs> Thank you so much for walking me through this. This is uh, a, a kind of a nice, um, <laughs> this is a good experience. Like it's a good opportunity for me to ask someone these questions without having to go to a pub, which <laughs> is not my like uh, normal sort of element. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And if I can just say one other thing, if anyone is interested in the Scots language, um, you know, by all means, have a look. I think, you know, if you, if you know English well, then, you know, Scots, as you can see, has a lot of common vocabulary and things like that. And it's a good thing to have a look at. Uh, you know, you can easily come to Scotland, you know, learn a little bit of Scots and it'll help your understanding. And if you decide you never want to speak a word of it, that's absolutely fine. You don't have to. And we certainly don't expect people mm. to. 
you know. Um, but, um, you know, it is very cool for understanding and, you know, learning more about Scottish culture and, and traditions and things like that. And here I am with my newly acquired knowledge of Scots, by which I mostly mean the old Scots. As Michael told me, if you want to know, like, the actual used Scots, the best thing to do is to find a place where you're staying, where, you know, the, the Scots you're looking for would be alive and well, go to a pub and ask some locals. This is not a good tip for me. All I wanted from this experience was to finally have a way of just paying someone to teach me the thing that I would normally have to go to a pub for. I do not want to go to pubs. Simon very sad about this. <laughs> However, I do have to agree with him, that is the optimal way of learning Scots for the specific place where you're traveling or moving, staying or whatnot. However, I have to warn you <laughs> that this is... However, I do have to warn you, uh, people in pubs when asked about Scots will be very tempted to turn this into a practical joke. They you know, just like people in many other languages, they will kind of tell you that something means something else. And to another uh, unrelated person, this thing might be extremely offensive. So if you learn something in a pub, something in Scots, maybe also like run it by someone else, perhaps someone you know slightly better, someone you do trust, or the internet. That is my pro tip as someone who does not trust people. <laughs> now, overall, this was an amazing experience. I've learned so much and I'm gonna prove some of that to you in a short while but uh, if you would like to learn some Scots with Michael or if you would like to delve into Scottish Gaelic or if you have any other languages you'd like to learn I have to say that italki was a really fun way of doing that and if you'd like to try italki with a little bit of a discount if you buy $10 credit you're gonna get five extra with the code kakibot this is limited to only 50 people so if <laughs> there are more than 50 of you who are super excited to learn some skills with Michael. You only have a couple of days until Burns Night, so quick, quick. <laughs> okay then, now it is truly time for me to embarrass myself and recite some Burns. Let's do this. Ferfe, your honest, sonsy face, great chieftain of the pudding race, a boon them all, you take your place. Pinch, tripe or therm, well, are you worthy? of a grace, as long as my arm. The groaning trencher, there you fill, your hurdies like a distant hill, your pin would help to mend a mill in time of need, while through your pores the dews distill like ember bead. His knife see rustic labor dicht and cut you up with ready slicht, trenching your gushing entrails bricht like ony ditch. And then, oh, what a glorious sight, warm, reeking, rich. Then, horn for horn, they stretch and strive. Deal tech the hindmost, on they drive, till their wheel swat kites belive are bent like drums. The old kidman must like to rive, but thank it hums. Is there that our his French ragu or olio that what stow a sow or fricassee would make her spew with perfect scunner looks down with sneering scornful view on sick a dinner? Poor devil, see him our his trash as feckless as a withered rash, his spindle shang a good whiplash, his neven it through bloody flood or field to dash. Oh, how unfit, but mark the rustic hag is fed. The trembling earth resounds his tread. Clap in his well in a blade, he'll make it whistle. And legs and arms and heads will sned like taps of trissel. Ye powers what make mankind your care and dish them out their billow fair, old Scotland wants nay skinking wear the jobs and luggies. But if you wish her grateful prayer, gear a haggis.